Well, you know, you often hear of the term freshman 15 when it comes to students going away to college in reference to the weight gain their first year. But the stress of being away from home for the first time can also trigger something else, and that's an eating disorder. In fact, eating disorders are sadly, they're becoming more common as students head back to school. Jennifer Lombardi is a therapist who specializes in eating disorders and has also battled one herself. She's here to share how we can help. Jennifer, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Thanks right. for being on the show. So how can back to school, how can the season trigger an eating disorder? Well, certainly any, as you were mentioning earlier, any change in environment um, and stress. so for stress, any kids going away to college for the first time, it's an entirely new experience. And of course that causes natural anxiety um, and having a change in the environment can be very, very stressful. And so for people who are predisposed to developing an eating disorder or for those who may be experiencing some degree of disordered eating, that environment is sort of, it, you know, it creates a situation where relying on, you know, restricting or binging or purging becomes kind of a way to cope with that. Jennifer, for people that may not be familiar, how common is this? You think a, a lot of us would be shocked by just how widespread eating disorders are? Well, in the United States, it's estimated that 5 to 10 million girls and women struggle with an eating disorder, and the estimate for boys and men is a million. Wow. Um, and so it is a, it's a huge problem, and certainly in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen those numbers continue to climb and also affect kids younger and younger. I mean, now I'm assessing kids who are seven, eight, and nine years wow. old, which is incredible. That are feeling the pressure of, of gaining weight or, or that they should lose weight at that young of an Absolutely. age. Absolutely. And is it a matter of fitting in? Because they've just come from high school where we know the pressure, pressure is high. Absolutely, but I think it's important for people to understand that eating disorders are caused for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And the way that I explain it to families and to patients is to think of it kind of like a puzzle, and there are five pieces to that puzzle. There's certainly a genetic component. Most often people who struggle have a history of either anxiety or depression. Certain personality traits, uh, people with eating disorders tend to be very people-pleasing, very driven, high achieving. And then, of course, trauma or loss, family dynamics, and our culture, which can tend to be very, very toxic and certainly encourages eating disorder oh, yeah. behavior, to say the least. Jennifer, what can we do to try to prevent eating disorders? I know it starts at a young age talking about healthy eating, but when we look at um, going into college, what is it start by looking at the signs and warnings to try to prevent this from happening? Well, certainly, and we and I, I certainly see this with the clients that I treat who are and the families getting very anxious about sending their sons or daughters away to college, who may have dabbled with an eating disorder and worrying that is this the right decision to make. And one of the things that I oftentimes tell them is to be very open and honest with their loved one. You know, don't be afraid to bring this subject up. Do their research. Go online. Learn about the medical complications. Learn about treatment options and then just be very honest and direct with them and also encourage them to make sure that their their children or their their young adults go to the health centers at campuses you know one of the one of the nice things now is that across the country we're seeing a lot of college campuses and their health centers become much more sophisticated and aware of eating disorders and so they do excellent screenings and even in the Sacramento area we see that quite often now we mentioned the freshman 15 uh, talk to us about that it's a complete myth so there's been a lot of research on this. Um, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has done an incredible amount of research basically saying it's false, it's not accurate. So what happens is, is that for people who have eating disorders, that certainly fuels the fire and this fear of going away and gaining weight, it certainly doesn't help them. But even for people who don't necessarily have a full-blown eating disorder, it only contributes to those feelings of you know, low self-esteem and you know, unnecessary body consciousness um, and it kind of creates a toxic environment. The way that I explain it to my clients is, you know, our culture is, is very toxic for people who are in treatment. And this is what we're looking for in terms of uh, some of the warning signs um, to identify an eating disorder. Can you step us through that? Do we... Is it if you, someone you love has more than one or two of these, we should seek help? I would suggest that if anybody is seeing at least even just one of these, it would be certainly a warning sign. I mean, obviously, rapid weight loss in a short period of time is a huge red flag. Disruption in the menstrual cycle. A lot of times what I see with physicians and with families, especially if it's a young woman who's an athlete, is that it's normalized, and really this is not normal. It's very unsafe for, for young women to not have their cycles, um, and it can cause long-term damage. Jennifer, for what worked for you to... Um, help with your eating disorder. What was it that helped you um, get treatment? Well, I was fortunate in the sense that I had a support system, you know, that was very encouraging for me to get treatment, and I found a wonderful therapist that I could work with. 
Um, but I also, there was a point in my life, I think, where I realized, I, I really became clear to me the things that I was going to lose. I was not going to be able to have a family. I wouldn't be able to have a future. And that became really important to me, so it was very motivating um, to get better. And so that's one of the things I try to identify with clients, help them understand that there's a life beyond their eating disorder and that full recovery really is possible. What's the number one thing we can do to prevent eating disorders? I think it's kind of a two-step piece here. I think the first thing is we have to, as a culture, make a huge shift. We have to stop speaking in a negative way about our own bodies, and we really have to stop vilifying foods as good or bad, junk or healthy. Um, and the second thing I would say is to recognize these are life-threatening illnesses, and early treatment is absolutely critical. Okay. Jennifer, thank you for being here and for sharing that information. I know very important uh, for a lot of kids as they go back to school and parents as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we appreciate it.